Damas y caballeros, por favor ponerse de pie para la entrada de Major General Michael Rothstein. Am I, uh, uh, you're am I on? Yes, sir. Okay. You are the boss, sir. All right. Then I'm just going to go. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to, uh, to tell a little bit about what's going on in the Air Force. I see a few of my Air Force brothers out here in the audience. Um, and it's great. You know, I've actually never been to Fort Benning, so this is a great uh, opportunity uh, to check that square and come to Fort Benning. I know there's a, you know, a real... A real rich history here. I was, I think you guys, 100 years yes. last year, right? Sure. Uh, in Maxwell Air Force, where I'm at, which is about two hours down the road, you know, they must have stood up, uh, you know, right about the same time. We, uh, we share about that same uh, set as we're getting into World War One. So great to be here. Uh, great to spend some time uh, with our partners from South America and Central America. And as I've been watching this area you know, really for the last, you know, my military generation, and I look at where we are today, uh, where those two regions are, uh, both in South America and Central America, and what a nice trajectory it's been on. You know, and it's not perfect, it's a little uneven, right? I mean, certainly in the news today, we've got, you know, Venezuela with a, a major crisis on its hands that I'm sure is spilling over to, you know, other parts, whether it's Brazil or Colombia, and, and the echoes, you know, throughout the whole region. But if you go back a generation um, and you look at the wave of democratization that has really kind of slowly but surely moved across uh, South America and Central America, I think it's positive, right? And you look at the anti-corruption movements, I think it's positive. Uh, and so there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of common sense. So, and I think the relationship between the United States uh, and this region is uh, tremendously important. And I know sometimes it feels not important to the United States military, but it's like as I've been in a commander and walked into units and I take, and I take one of my subunits, they go, hey, I'm not going to pay as much attention to you guys because it's going pretty good. I got to put my focus over here on the units that aren't going so, so well. And so the relationships, I think, between our country and our military and your respective militaries and countries you know, is vital. This is our neighborhood. And if we can't have peace and prosperity in our neighborhood collectively in the Western Hemisphere, then we're going to be in trouble. Uh, and so I appreciate that you all are invested in this. The fact that you're here tells me that you and your countries are, are both personally and organizationally invested. And so I thank you for that. So what I'd like to do today is this, if I could with you. I want to start out first talking uh, a little bit about the National Defense Strategy. And I want to put it through the lens, sort of through the airman's lens and how I've seen it unfold and how we are, how we got to where we are today. I know you've looked at the national defense strategy, so I'm not going to try to teach you the national defense strategy. I want to give you some context. Uh, and then from there, I want to talk next about uh, what's going on in the United States Air Force, sort of how we see our priorities and where we see the future going. And then I want to leave plenty of time for questions to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Is that fair enough? Okay, here's what I would also ask you. If as I'm talking, you've got a question or you want to interrupt, please feel free to do that. Now, if you want to save it, that's okay too. Um, but I would much rather this be a dialogue and a discussion um, because I can love listening to myself talk all day. I'll just keep going uh, if you don't stop, all right? So with that in mind, uh, let's dive in and talk a little bit about the national defense strategy. Now, in our country, uh, you have some documents that come out uh, that sort of should be guiding where we're going as a defense establishment. The first is the national security strategy, and that's written as a level at the level of our, you know, uh, president. You know, he signs that, usually written by our national security agency or some of the staffers on that, and that's setting the big picture. And then below that, and in a perfect world, next comes the national defense strategy. That's signed out typically at the level of our secretary of defense, and that should put meet in context to the military aspect of the national security strategy, right? That's the way the system is supposed to work. Well, I've been watching this system for 
35 plus years since I was a national security major at our Air Force Academy. And it doesn't always work quite like that, right? Sometimes the national defense strategy is released before the national security strategy. Sometimes there's a four year gap. It's not always synchronized real perfectly. Um, but this one actually is synchronized pretty well. The national security strategy dropped, the national defense strategy after that. I know in the background there was a lot of discussion between the two. And so this one's different than what I've seen really in my adult military career. I probably forgot when it was back in the 80s, younger in my military career, but certainly in the last 15, 20 years, I would argue to you that this national defense strategy is different. And I think it's different for three reasons. The first reason I think is that it's actually a strategy. It actually talks about some priorities and some areas where we're gonna take risk. It actually tells our services what we need to be doing. And it's pretty clear and articulate and I think pretty well made. Not all of our national defense strategies have been that way. Mike Rossi's opinion is sometimes they've been, they've said a lot of good things and they read pretty well, but they don't really say here's where the focus is. And like you all probably have in your own organizations, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. But this one's a little different. That's the first reason that stands out to me. The second reason that it stands out is that this national defense strategy has more buy-in from our establishment in the Pentagon, both our civilian leadership and our military leadership, really across all of our services, than any strategy I've seen so far. There's a real buy-in and belief that that's what we need to do. And I'm sure just like in your countries, right? Just because some document comes out from the president's office or the prime minister's office or the four-star general's office or the two-star general office does not mean it's gonna happen. So that buy-in is really important. And I think this national defense strategy has buy-in, critically important. Then the third thing that I think is different about this one is that Secretary Mattis and his team, and I know Secretary Mattis, of course, has, you know, resigned uh, four or five months ago, but they put in a pretty good machine to take that national defense strategy and rather than let it go sit on a shelf somewhere, but to start driving action across our giant bureaucracy, which is the Department of Defense, to turn that strategy into action. And so you can have the best written strategy but if you don't actually start doing the things that turn that into reality, it's no good. So those are three things that I think make this very different. Yeah. So if they mark two, they disarm you. My question, sir, is um, you, you mentioned that what makes this strategy different is that there's buy-in. What 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 caused that buy-in that didn't exist in, in the previous strategy? So, so I think the buy-in uh, came from, so the buy-in came, I think, for a couple reasons. One is it was well socialized uh, in the building up, right? So I know personally, I've talked to our secretary of our Air Force, I've talked to our chief of staff of the Air Force, they feel like they had a full participation in the building of the national defense strategy. It wasn't just issued to them you know, made in some small room or somewhere, right? And then it popped out from behind the closed doors written by, you know, three of Secretary Mattis's best authors and best strategists. So they had, so they had the ability to influence and shape it. The second, and, and I think, uh, while I haven't spoken for the other services, I, my sense is there's a belief the same way about the other services, again, both civilian leadership and military leadership. And then I think the second, is a growing awareness over the last few years that that the world is changing and let me and let me unpack that for you because i was going to unpack that for you next anyway so so you're a great straight man for me to lead me up on that so so that's why i think it's it's different but let me back up and kind of give you a, a sense of where i think we've been in this arc over the last 30 years and why why things are changing now and it's, it's a little bit through the airman's perspective because I think if I was a special operator or maybe an army officer or naval officer, my, my perspective might be a little different. But I would say we need to go back to about 1989, to the fall of the Berlin Wall, 
And shortly after that, the dissolution of the Soviet Union a couple years later. And when that happened, the reason for being of the U.S. military, certainly the U.S. Air Force is part of that, but I think overall the U.S. military changed. And the 90s, writ large, was marked by us figuring out what do we do, right? We had spent 40 years in the Cold War, and now we had won the Cold <coughs> War, or the, and now you go, why do you need a military? How should you, how big should it be? What should its primary missions be? And what capabilities does it have? So the 1990s found us in places like Desert Storm, right? And the Gulf War with Iraq. That was really not probably our reason for being, but something we had to go do. They found us in places like Bosnia and Kosovo and peacekeeping. And it saw the very big decline of the size of the military. The US Air Force dropped by about a third across the 90s. That is not a small drop. So we were two thirds the size coming out of that. And then of course 2001 hit and 9-11 changed with a significant emotional event the outlook of the U.S. military. And we started the global war on terror. And that became an issue of primary importance to our country. <clears throat> Followed up on that, of course, with Afghanistan and Iraq. And so now across the 2000s, we're doing sort of two main things with our military. Global war on terrorism and counterinsurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's continuing, of course, you know, to this day, up and down a little bit in Iraq and up and down a little bit in Afghanistan, but it continues. So we go through the 2010s, and we're focused there. In 2011, you may recall, President Obama talked about the pivot to the Pacific. Everybody remember that? And, and that was, I think, a strategic attempt from a national security perspective that says, hey, we know we're getting kind of mold down in Iraq and Afghanistan, which may not be the most important things going on there. And we got to remember that we are a Pacific nation on the, on the right half of the Pacific, maybe not on the left half, but much like many of your countries, right? Pacific nation, and we have to turn our attention. Now, I would submit to you that while the thought of that strategically was probably pretty good, I don't think it actually got as much traction as they had hoped, right? When you're trying to pivot the military towards the Pacific, but you still got fights going on in Iraq and fights going on in Afghanistan and, and other places in the Middle East, it was really hard to turn the bureaucracy. And so while we talked about it, the actions didn't quite follow up on it because there were real tugs and pulls of other priorities. And it's hard to pull folks out when you've got folks dying in Iraq and Afghanistan to, to reallocate resources and attention. So 2011, Pacific to the uh, Pacific. 2012, Russia invades Crimea and the Ukraine. And that gets our attention. And while we weren't real heavily militarily involved there, of course, it kind of woke everybody up and said maybe Russia is not quite the Russia we thought they were going to be. And then in 2015, uh, General Dunford became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Marine General Joseph Dun Dunford. What you start hearing about sort of talking amongst our military, uh, although we didn't really publish it anywhere, was this idea of four plus one as a way to characterize the threat. And this is a way to go, what kind of military do we need? Because when you go to Congress and you go, what, what do we need for budgets? What kind of end strength do we need? Well, I need a military to do what? And so this four plus one was Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and violent extremism. That was the four plus one. As a way to characterize the, the threat, the potential threats that we might need to deal with. And so we started shifting our mindset to talk a little more about that. And there was a tug and pull within the Pentagon um, for resources. You know, I spent a lot of my time uh, working in the Middle East or in Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iraq. And a few years ago, I was a commander in Afghanistan, and I wasn't getting the resources I needed. You know, this is in 2014 and 15. And I said, "What do you got? You got to be kidding me! I'm a I'm a combat commander. 
and you're not giving me, you know, what I need to do the job because we were recognizing that we got to start trying to reset. And being a commander downrange, that was not fun for me. But this is what you're starting to see the changes is we got to think about rebalancing our portfolio. So, national defense strategy comes out. And now you're probably familiar with the term. We went from four plus one and say, now that's, you know, and General Mattis essentially said, that's probably not the best way to characterize it. It's really two plus three. China and Russia, first and foremost, Iran, North Korea, and violent strength. Just that small change talked about the emphasis that we need to put on the two. And of the two, I would contend to you that I think China is the pacing threat. Right? Between China and Russia, as we look at it from the United States Air Force, um, both have a potential to be peer competitors for us. But China's got a population eight times the size of Russia and an economy 10 times the size of Russia. And even though population growth in China has, I think they're at about 0.4% last time I looked, you know, Russia's at negative 1.7%. So in the long arc of history, those two things are gonna start going away. So we need to pay attention to both, but first and foremost, we've got to pay attention to China. So that's kind of some of the context of the national defense strategy. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to calm down when I say something. Uh, so quick, not, not a semantic question. But yesterday, an Army uh, lead referred to two plus two plus one. So I'm wondering, is that, which is almost the same thing, is that a semantic difference based on service? They talked about the fact that the joint level were having some difficulty getting the consensus on several terms. I was wondering if that was a difference between Air Force and Army, or if there's still some debate about if it's two plus three or two plus two plus one. Good question. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. The longer answer is I don't think when I said that, that I was trying to make a point about something. It's really about the two plus others, right? As opposed to the, the second part of the two plus one. You know, certainly the nature of how you have to think about uh, violent extremism and that sort of thing is a different kind than, than a nation state. Um, but I, um, I have not heard that, and because I'm also not up in the Pentagon, some of those nuanced discussions may be missing me. But, but I don't think in the Air Force, um, I think the big takeaway message is, is the first two, not so much trying to call out the other one. So, um, so that's where I go on that. All right, so that's some of the context uh, of, of where we are. Uh, and then I'll come back. You know, and then, of course, what Secretary Mattis you know, remind us all is that you know, we don't have any God-given right to be the best military in the world. You know, we, we were there for a number of years, and well, I believe we still are there. But if we don't stay on top of this, you know, our military advantage is eroding. The Chinese and the Russians are catching up in some areas. In some areas, I think they're on a trajectory that if we don't change our trajectory, they're going to cross us here relatively <coughs> In some areas, I think they are arguably ahead of us. There's a good chance. It's hard, it's hard to know for sure in areas like cyber in terms of what the capabilities are. Um, but those are a couple areas. So we have no preordained right. And we have to refocus. And it's no longer the primary threat to the United States. It is no longer terrorism, but it is strategic competition among nation states. And if you take nothing else out of our national defense strategy, that is the headline. <coughs> so, what does that mean to the United States Air Force? We have five priorities in the United States Air Force, and I'll kind of run you through them and use that as a place to hang some discussions of how the last you know, 20 years have impacted us and where we think we're trying to go. So the first priority is to restore readiness. Now, I will tell you that you're in the United States Air Force, a lot like the other services, we've been running hard. We've been running hard. We were doing it in the 90s. You know, after the Gulf War, you know, we were the service that was holding down the fort in, Iraq, in you know, south of Iraq and trying to do that. 
more so, I think, than the other services and also in, in northern Iraq. When 9-11 hit, certainly everybody started running hard. Um, and we've been doing it, doing it ever since. And it takes a toll. So let me give you an example. So I grew up as an F-16 pilot uh, in the Air Force. And if we're going to take an F-16 squadron and deploy them to Afghanistan or Iraq, take your pick, it doesn't really matter. That unit, and you guys understand this, you're military professionals, um, so I know you get this. But at least six months prior, if not more, that unit is going to start spinning up for that deployment. They're going to deploy for six months, which we know really takes about eight months by the time you start deploying and by the time you get back. So now you're at 14 months. And then when you get back, of course, you got to give some of your folks a break. You've got a lot of personnel turnover because you've managed your personnel to optimize for the deployment. So those people who are ready to rotate out of the unit, there's a good chance you've been holding on to them. And now, you know, you lose more than your typical number of people on the back end of this because you've been holding on to it for the deployment. And then you kind of got to ramp back up afterwards. So it's probably 18 to 20 months at least from where you were to do this deployment. From a training perspective, the skill set that you want to go use in an F-16, and it's the same if you're an infantry officer, the skill set an infantry officer is going to use in Afghanistan is different than the skill set an infantry officer is going to use in Kaliningrad if you're having to fight the Russians over in that part of the world. So you got to start retraining, and you haven't been doing it for a year and a half. So your trainers and your instructors are not on their, their best game anymore. So this takes a toll. It takes a toll on our aircraft. So typically an F-16, you're going to put about five times as many hours on an F-16 on a six-month deployment than that same aircraft would fly if it were back at home station doing normal things. And that five times as many hours has a second order effect to parts and logistics and maintenance and your maintenance force. And it wears on you when you've been doing this year after year for 20 years. And that's what our Air Force is doing, has been doing. I use that example of an F-16, but you can insert a lot of other platforms and the basic premises remain the same. So we're kind of been We've been riding hard for a long time. And our readiness is down. The capability rates of our aircraft are down. We have people leaving the service because they've been rode hard and they're tired. And so we have some retention issues in some places. And so our first order of business is to get readiness back up. Putting more money into the accounts for, uh, to keep our mission capability rates up on our aircraft trying to buy more maintainers. We were about 4,000 maintainers short a couple years ago. We've been working on that. And now we've got the maintainers back in the system, but candidly speaking, they're not as experienced as we need them to be. So, you know, a bunch of young, a young folks doesn't help you as you, like, like any, you know, in your organizations, right? It's not just about the people, it's the right skill level of people and the right ranks of people. So we're still working on that, but we're making progress. And so readiness is, is really important. And Secretary Mattis, before, you know, back probably last fall, he came out and said, by goodness, you're going to get your mission capability rates in your frontline fighters, F-35, F-22, F-16, and some other platforms. In other words, those ones that are optimized against peer competition, you're going to get your, your rates back up. And so we had Rob other accounts to, to buy parts and do all that stuff to focus, right? To have priorities, like a strategy demands, because there's no free chicken, right? If you want more of something else, odds are you got to do less of something. Else. So we more. And my building back at Macville University today has a significant air conditioning problem that's not going to get fixed for a couple years because it's paying for parts for F-35. And so be it. And it's less than optimum. But the world lived without air conditioning for hundreds of years, and we'll figure it out, right? But those are some of the trade-offs because we took some money out of the accounts we use for, for building maintenance and put it into readiness. So restoring readiness across our force is a top priority for the United States Air Force. 
The second is that we've got to modernize. We got to do it cost effectively. So we have to modernize our fleet. So um, when I was in Afghanistan the three years ago before I left, I was flying a C-130 that was built in 1961. Older than I am. We have B-52s that are coming up on 70 years old. Now, amazing that they're still flying. They still do a great job. But we have to recapitalize our fleet. This statistics, a couple of years dated because we've added some more remotely controlled aircraft and some things like that. But about two years ago, the average age of an aircraft in the United States Air Force is 25.8 years old. Anybody here driving a car that old? <laughs> that's average, folks. That's not the oldest. That's the average age of an aircraft. And we've got to modernize for a new type of threat. Right? We just can't buy new old. Right? We can't buy more of what we had before and just get it newer because the threat's changing. We got to buy new new. And that's why we're focused on some things like the B-21. The last time we produced a bomber was in 1997. The B-2. That's 22 years ago, folks. So the B-21 is out there research and development now to be that next generation model. That's still probably a decade away, right? That's going to be 30 some odd years. We've got to recapitalize our tanker fleet, right? That ability to reach out, what makes the U.S. Air Force in combination with our other joint partners and our other international partners so powerful is our ability to have global reach and global power. You can't do that without tankers, folks. It does not work. And again, tankers have to be recapitalized. KC-46, an important buy for us. The F-35, by the way, just dropped, I think yesterday, it's for, the US Air Force just dropped its first uh, combat bomb off an F-35 yesterday out of the Force Fighter Squadron and Hill Air Force Base, uh, deployed over in the Middle East. Uh, you got to think of the F-35 not just as something that can deliver ordnance, whether that's in the air or in the ground, but it's also uh, like a quarterback. And I know I probably shouldn't use an American football analogy with this audience, but the sensors and the communication capability allows that F-35 to be almost a command and control node in the air. And that's really going to gonna be really important as we get into the next fight. So we've got to cost effectively modernize our fleet. And we've got to do it in a way that the American taxpayer can afford. And there's a story there because, you know, having the best Air Force in the world is really expensive. The only thing more expensive than having the best Air Force in the world is having the second best Air Force in the world. Because when you lose that fight to the best Air Force in the world, then it gets really expensive. So we've got to do that. We've got to grow up. And today we're, we need 386 operational squadrons is what we think we need in our United States Air Force. And we're down in the low 300s right now. We don't have an Air Force the size to do what our nation is asking us to do. And so we've got to try to grow that. And that's going to be an important part of our future. In 1987, we had 407 operational squadrons. And again, now we're down to almost, you know, 100 less than that, we've got to grow back up. And when I say operational squadrons, that's sort of the combination of things like uh, fighter squadrons, bomber squadrons, tanker, mobility, space, cyber. Now, think of those like the fist, because when those are going to come together and create effects, but behind that, of course, is still our combat support, still all that stuff. So it's more than, we have more squadrons in the Air Force, but that's the operational side of that, so that can come together and be the fist of the United States Air Force. We've got to modernize, we've got to grow to do what our nation's asking for. The third priority of the United States Air Force is to drive innovation. Now, I think we are a little bit victims of success. 
you know, our military United States Air Force. We have been dominant for at least 30 years. And when you're dominant and the world is, I don't want to say the world is at peace, but when there is no big opponent that could have really come after us at the national level across the last 30 years, the bureaucracy takes over. And when you have choices between risk and reward, the answer tends to be, let's not take risk. Because there's not a big enough reward out there to justify it. I think we've got to break that out of our habit in the United States Air Force. We've got to be able to procure and innovate at the speed of relevance. So there's a guy by the name of, um, I think it's David Moore. I may be butcher. I may have lost his first name. And, and it's called Moore's Law. And he was back in the 1960s in the early parts of computing, and his, prob his, his forecast was that the computing power of the microchip would double every 18 months. He actually said two years back then, but it turned into 18 months over the few years, right? So every 18 months, you get twice the computing power out of computers. And that's called Moore's Law. And that's relatively held true, although it's flattened off a little bit. I think we're somewhere around three years right now. But for the most part, for the last 50 years, 55 years, that Moore's Law is held pretty true. So here's the problem in the United States Air Force. Is it takes us about 10 Moore's Laws. That's 15 years for you math majors in here, right? <laughs> about 10 Moore's Laws to field a new weapon system. 15 years. And think about how fast technology is growing and how fast things are changing in 15 years. And if that's what it takes us to do, we are going to be out innovated and out you know, past relevancy by our apps. We've got to fix that. <coughs> Let me break down even for you real quick for how it works. And these are all just sort of, you know, um, to put you in the ballpark. So we got a new idea of we need a new satellite. So the first thing we do is we do an analysis of alternatives because we're going to make sure we're not just going to go out and buy it, right? We've got to go check out the alternatives. There's a year and a half, maybe two years to do that because you want to make sure it's coordinated, right? Because they want to make sure that you had a chance to talk about it and you had a chance to put your input in. So we do all this great big coordination. A year and a half goes by. And we go, okay, here's what we're doing. Then we put it out for contract. Well, you got to give the contractors time to put their bids together and do all that. There's another year gone. Maybe six months later, after we evaluate all the proposals, we make a choice. Ooh, we're making progress. But wait, your company lost the bid. So now your company is going to protest the bid to make sure that you have another shot at yeah? And because in our country, we don't really have laws that dissuade your company from doing this, you know, and this is a big contract, right, for some pretty expensive satellites. You throw and you protest it. Maybe you win it. Maybe you don't. But the risk for you is certainly worth the reward because if you lose that protest, you're out some legal fees and some time, but that's relatively small compared to if you win that protest. So there's another year and a half gone by. Now we can start. Now we've picked someone to go build this thing. But... They got to gin up a factory. They got to hire people. They got to train them, right? They got to get all their subcontractors in line. And they didn't necessarily want to do all this while we we're waiting on the protest. Because if they lose that protest, all that money's wasted for them, right? And a couple more years go by. And then we build it. And then we test it. And oh, by the way, somewhere along the way, because now six or eight years have gone by, if not more. We changed our mind about a couple things and said, oh, no, I really want this satellite to do this. Or, oh, we didn't think we need this. So we changed the requirement, which puts us back in a little another loop. And the contractor says, I can do that for you. Just give me another six months and a couple hundred more million dollars, whatever it is, right? <laughs> and it goes on. And then we get into our testing. And we don't want to fail, so we test this thing. Lights out, right, for the 99.9 .9 percentile. There's a joke that you know, says, hey, we don't mind failing with our procurement stuff as long as it takes a really long time and it's really fast, which is just the wrong thing, of course, right? So we've got to figure out how to break this cycle. 
And we're starting to do that in our military. We're starting to take advantage of some of the acquisition <laughs> laws that were actually there before, but we were not willing to take the risk to use them. And Congress is helping us, and we're starting to get this acquisition train moving a little faster. It's still going to be hard. But we've got to drive innovation. We've got to upgrade at the speed of relevance because we are far too slow. And there is, you know, and we are our own worst enemy. We being the United States, across our services, across our DOD, across our Congress. Because as soon as something goes wrong, <coughs> right, we kill that person. And it trains all the other people and says, well, the best thing to do is make sure you don't fail. Right? We haven't put the reward in for people trying to seize opportunities. And we've got to drive innovation at the lower levels too. And I believe that our Air Force, because we're working on 30 years of success, because we've gotten comfortable, because we've been dominant, we're not thinking like a challenger anymore. And we're not taking those risks. And we've got to build leaders at our squadron command level, at our NCO level, that are willing to think differently, are willing to take risks, are willing to accept failures. And we as the older generation have got to be willing to live with some of that. And take the people who are risk takers and say, great job. I know you failed, but I like what you were thinking. Brush them off and move them along so that we can build leaders who when we get into a war that is contested, a no-joke shooting war with a Russia or China, that they will be bold and daring, that they will be comfortable making decisions when they cannot communicate with their higher headquarters, and they are ready to think differently. Because the Russians and the Chinese have been reading our playbooks for 30 years. So we've got to do this differently to drive innovation. And we've got to develop excellent leaders, which is the fourth priority in the United States. And those two things, I believe, are tied together. Because I believe it's going to be that leadership that's going to matter in the next life. And we've got to drive leaders who are ready to live in that VUCA environment. Do you all talk about the VUCA environment here at all anymore? So VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that's what that environment is going to be. And we've got to get them ready for that. Then the last part of the United States Air Force is to strengthen our alliances and partnerships. We know we are not going to fight alone. And one of the great strengths we have, we think, as a nation and as a U.S. military that our, our potential adversaries don't have is that we've got friends around the world. Friends who will stand with us and fight with us if we need to. Friends that can rely on us so we can rely on them. The Russians and the Chinese, not so much. And Secretary Mattis, you know, he, he believed that to be one of our core great strengths. Right? As we talk about center of gravity, right, the source of our power that we have are those relationships. And of course, it's really easy to talk about relationships when I'm standing in a room like this, right? Because this is what building those relationships are all about. Because the relationships that you're going to make here with each other, and I don't mean just with the U.S. and your country, but certainly amongst, amongst nations of Central and South America, you'll have for the rest of your life. And as you get older in your military, it will become the same faces in different places. And as Secretary Mattis also said, it is not about command relationships, it is about relationships among commanders. And the trust that you establish here, the relationships, will pay dividends 15 years from now when. Someone from this class shows up on your doorstep because they're helping you through a hurricane or because there's civil unrest or because we're going over to work some peacekeeping together in Africa or whatever it may be. Those relationships matter. And we know in the United States Air Force the importance of those relationships. We don't always execute it the best, right? We are still fighting things like overclassification and interoperability but we understand the importance of it, and we're trying to do it better. So those are the U.S. Air Force priorities and sort of how they relate, I think, to this changing evolution of our national security situation. Restore readiness, 
cost effectively modernize, drive in innovation, build outstanding leaders, and strengthen our alliances and partnerships. And so I hope that gives me a sense of where we are. Uh, as I said, as we go for about 30, 35 minutes, I think I'll pause here. Uh, actually, let me talk about one more thing and then I'll pause. And that's a little bit of how we see the next fight. And I won't touch on all the characteristics, but there are a couple that I do want to highlight. One is, I think, uh, the importance of multi-domain operations, right? As we envision the next fight, I think our strength will be able to create multiple problems for the enemy in a tightly timed sequence that overwhelms us, right? Our ability to orchestrate and command and control so that from land, from sea, from air, from space, from cyber, in the electromagnetic spectrum, wherever it is, we can create those multiple dilemmas and maybe he can handle one or two, but he's not gonna handle the three or four that are coming. And our ability to do that in a tight timing sequence because we have exquisite command and control that allows us to take those effects and wrap them together in a holistic way, I think can be our key asset that we have as the United States military. So much like the US Army and much like the other services, the Air Force is really trying to focus on multi-domain operations. Now, I will tell you, do we have it all figured out yet? <clears throat> Absolutely not. I think we're pretty early in this stage to bring it all together, especially to do it in the sort of timing sequence to do it and to do it well. Operational level warfare is really hard to practice, right? Tactical stuff's a lot easier to practice. You can go do that with your unit and small units. But to bring this together at the operational level is really important, really hard. We've been relatively fortunate, if you will, for the last 30 years. We haven't had to be all that great <coughs> operationally because of the timing and the tempo, the nature of counterinsurgency and global war on terrorism. But the next fight's going to go so much faster. It's going to be so much more complicated, so much more contested. We've got to take our operational acumen up the level. So let me pause there. Good. We'll go to questions and see what else is on your mind. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Major Chaparro. I'm a New Mexico National Guard. Uh, in the topic of innovation, um, we're coming here. I've had to deal with multiple uh, fiber optic contracts for service contract systems. Uh, I agree, which said on the, the process, the acquisition process, uh, getting stuff purchased, sometimes uh, we are our worst enemy. Um, they miss the flexibility, uh, the time constraint that we have. Uh, so I think we all can share that same uh, issue. Is there a conversation at your level for the joint staff or, or at Congress? Uh, I, I think we are working with an antiquated old, my purpose, um, point of view regulation that it's almost benefiting them and not the, the, the user, the, the, the customer. So is, is, do you see any, any possible any uh, changes or any, anything that would help us uh, on our end and, and expedite the process and make it more user friendly for us? couple things going on um, on that. One is, and I don't know the details, I just know that it's sort of happening, so I can't unpack this for you very well. But one is there's certainly at the DOD level and at the service level with Congress uh, inputs to, to, to change laws that will make it more user-friendly, if you will. The other thing, and we, you find this a lot, is half the things that we complain about we could actually do, right? And we may not be able to do at the level you're at, right? But when you go to Congress and you go, I can't, you know, it takes me this long to do this. They go, no, you, if you would have done it this way, that guy could have proved that to do it overnight. You're bureaucracy, you know, so you're your own worst enemy because either you didn't take it to your, to the right person in your own service or whatever it was. So I think we've got to do both things. I think we've got to be more aggressive about using the powers and authorities that Congress has already given us that, that we bureaucratically did not exercise those muscles. And, I, and I've been there just, just literally, this wasn't a war fighting issue, but about four weeks ago, you know, I was told, sir, you cannot do that, it's illegal. To find out when I pushed and pushed, no, I could totally do that, it just needed two more levels above for the waiver authority, to which when he found out what we were talking about, he said, of course we're gonna waive that, go, right? So, so people are telling me things that they believe to be illegal and they, and they weren't lying to me, they were just misinformed, right? Um, so I think we have to push on both sides of that to make progress. 
And I think it's getting better. We're certainly not there yet. Um, and, and I also think we've under-resourced that area because we do so much more through contracts now. We just got to throw some more manpower at it. For Major Lee, United States Air Force. So my question is on multi-domain operations. We've talked about even in this class how it's the future, um, but there isn't a common doctrinal definition. And so if you can put on your doctrine center hat for a minute, how close are we either as a joint force or as a service to publish specific doctrines so we're all talking in the same language and like have a good grasp on then how to execute? So, um, so let me put on my service, service hat. And in, the, in my service hat as a head of, Air, of doctrine for the United States Air Force, we're not that close. And here's a little bit why. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use some semantics on you, right? So the way this ought to work is you ought to start with a concept, right? You take that concept, and, and, the, and I'm choosing the word concept very, very particularly in how we use our lexicon in the US Air Force at least, right? And then you're gonna do things like you're gonna war game that concept and tweak it. You're gonna exercise that concept and tweak it. You're gonna maybe, um, experiment well probably experiment before you exercise right but you're going to do those and there are going to be these little circular loops going on and then on the back end when you feel comfortable that you've wrung out the concept very well that's when it becomes doctrine so the way we use doctrine in our service which i don't always agree with by the way and i've been working on shifting this for us over the last year and a half is our doctrine tends to be backwards looking right because it's the best practices of things we're comfortable with. I think we've got to get a little more forward looking in our doctrine and, and take a little more risk to say, hey, maybe we haven't quite rung this out, but we've got to do just what you said. We got to get everyone start thinking about a common lexicon. And we've been doing some, some war gaming. Uh, we have a thing going on now uh, within my command called the Do Little series, where we were trying to, but we're, what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to build the concept because we're, we're pre-conceptual on this. Um, now, whether we call it doctrine, whether we call it concept, I don't really care, but we've got to get to what you're talking about to where we can start to get to a common lexicon. But you also have to realize that whatever we're going to come up with, you know, it's going to be version one, and we're going to end up on version 7.2, you know, several years down the road. And, and we've got to be okay with that, right? You can't go faster and not have risk and not be willing to change, right? So if we want it to be perfect coming out the shoot, then give me five years or six years and I'll get you to perfection. If you want something that'll get us moving in the right direction, I'll give you a beta version a little sooner, right? And that's, so um, we're talking about it. We're moving that way. I mean, six months ago, you know, the army was talking multi-domain battle and we were talking multi-domain operations. In the Air Force, we were sort of talking multi-domain operations to talk about airspace and cyber effects. But most of us realize that if what we really need is we need a joint concept where we're talking about synchronizing those effects across all the domains. And then if you really want to get fun, then the you know, State Department is going to raise their hand and go, well, what about interagency whole government uh, as we go there? But I think that's, again, trying to take the whole bite of the apple now. But I think we're going to start evolving to more of a, a, a joint common consensus, but we're not there. <coughs> but the conversations are going on, um, but I think we're, it still has to evolve. Yep. Is that my get off the no, stage? The, we have a time for more, one more question, sir. Right. Sir Major Meyerhoff, uh, Air Force. Uh, I had a question for you about innovation. It's been kind of a buzzword the last four to five years in the Air Force. Right. My question to you is, and for everybody who's in the atmosphere, the Air Force kind of culture. How do you give people the time and space at a low level to innovate? We have all the thugs and pulls and yep. new bureaucracy. And all no, you're, and yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and you know, the easy answer, of course, is leadership, right? Uh, and innovation, you know, like all good ideas, right? We're going to latch on innovation, and we're not going to we're going to do it clumsily. Uh, and innovation is really a mindset. Right. In, in my mind, innovation is a mindset that says um, we're going to try to do things different. We're going to try to create the space that's going to allow you to fail. We're going to get smart on how you innovate. I, I spent some time with uh, a guy who's called the Dean of Innovation up in the University of Michigan. Um, 
Holy Smokes, uh, Jeff DeGraff. And so he's written a really good book on in innovation. We've got a fair amount of time together. So we've got to think about building an innovation mindset. And part and parcel of that is the willingness to accept failure, which we're not real good at in the United States Air Force right now. So we got to start with that. We got to start rewarding some risk takers. And we got to start be willing to say no to doing some other things to create the time and space to allow folks to tinker and play. Now, that's hard, but I would also tell you it's in our control. It, you know, and if you're a squadron commander, you can do that. Now, I'm not saying they won't come at some cost, right? Because it's, you know, and, and maybe it'll come at the cost of not being as timely with the administrative stuff. Maybe it'll come, you know, taking risk in some area and say, dear God, I hope that doesn't fail because I'm going to put this on ignore. Um, and hope that it, you know, and you got to do that smartly, of course. Um, but I think we've got a lot more control over it than we think we do. And it's easy to blame the man for not doing it. But I think, I think if we start chunking away at this, we can, we can start turning this shit. All right. I think that's, uh, okay. Thank you for letting me spend some time with you. I hope that was uh, useful for you. Uh, Thanks for investing your own time and your country's time here to be better. Uh, and no pressure, but we're all counting on you to lead the future. So don't screw it up. Ooh, <laughs> all right. Here we go. So before you go, uh, in front of our, our, our audience here uh, in real time and in, in, in the virtual world, we're, we're very grateful of your visits. Uh, as you know, we are trying to work better and more closely with the Air Force, particularly the Air University uh, that you lead. And uh, we're very proud to have Air Force students, not only from the United States, but for, for all our partner nations. So for us as a joint organization that trying to, like you mentioned, uh, uh, work together with other partner nations is one of the priorities of the National Defense Strategy. And I'm glad that the Air Force as well. Uh, we're very grateful for, for your words, for your wisdom that you're sharing with us, and also what, what this uh, visit symbolized to us. So we would like to give you a little uh, farewell. Uh, uh, give one is a, a, a small certificate. And, uh, and a coin from all the men and women right. of uh, Winsex. Thank you Gracias. for spending Thank time you. with us. Sir. Thanks. Tomemos cinco minutos de descanso. Muchas gracias por los aportes.